Welcome to the Teachers on Fire podcast, where I profile agents of growth and transformation in education today. Each guest shares their highs, their lows, their passions, their goals, and the resources that are shaping their thinking and inspiring their practice. For show notes and links from each episode, visit teachersonfire.net. You can also follow the show at Teachers on Fire on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And of course, please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm your host, Tim Cavey. Let's meet today's guest. Today, I'm speaking with Kevin O'Shea. Kevin is a primary teacher currently in Beijing, China, and soon to move to a school in Shenzhen, also in China. He's a big fan of nature, outdoor education, inquiry, and photography. He's also the producer of the Just Japan podcast and the new Making Better Teachers podcast. You can follow Kevin on Twitter at Mad for Maple and visit his blog at makingbetterteachers.com. And of course, subscribe to his podcast by the same name. So Kevin, thank you so much for joining us all the way from Beijing. Are you ready to talk education today? I am, absolutely. And thank you for, for having me on the podcast. Well, what a pleasure. I love what you're putting out there, and uh, I look forward to getting back to the Making Better Teachers podcast, talking more about that. But first of all, Kevin, tell us a little bit more about your current context. What does life look like for you on a daily basis? Well, um, I'm teaching at the Canadian International School here in Beijing. And um, yeah, so I'm in Beijing, China. I'm wrapping up my second school year, just a few weeks left. And uh, yeah, so I work at a school where basically... Uh, I'm teaching a mixture of non-Chinese children, international children. Um, we are kind of slap dab in the middle of the embassy zone, the embassy district of Beijing. So we get a lot of kids um, who have parents who are diplomats, uh, work for big companies. And we also have a, you know, quite a few kids who are, who are uh, Chinese. Um, whose parents, you know, are really interested in international education. Very, very interesting context. And you, you've got a very checkered, uh, very, well, I don't know if checkered is the right word, but a varied and interesting resume, sir. So you've seen a lot of different contexts. That's one of the reasons I'm excited to chat with you. But I want to start with story time. So Kevin, share with us, if you will, about a low moment or an experience of adversity, something that you faced in your teaching or education career that was a challenge and describe how you overcame it. All right. Well, um, you know, I've spent my entire teaching career in the international context. So I've been a teacher in South Korea, Japan, and now China. And the only teaching I actually did in Canada was my student teaching. Um, so, you know, when I, <clears throat> when I, I thought about a low moment, the first thing that pops into my mind was something that happened kind of early in my career while I was working in Japan. And, and a lot of this has to do with when you're working internationally, it does take time, but it's really important to get to, to understand the culture you're working in, the way the local parents might think, why they behave certain ways. And when you're new, relatively new, you just don't know these things. So, um, it was early in my career. I'm in Japan and uh, working at a small international school. And we were told by administration that for the winter holiday, we had to give out a winter holiday homework package because... Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, and this is something the teachers are like, really? We have to do this? And they said, absolutely, you have to do this. This is what the, you know, air quotes, customers demand. Right. So, you know, Japanese parents are very concerned about education. And, um, you know, maybe some parents who are kind of traditionally educated... They're kind of the concept of more is better is, is alive and well. Um, so begrudgingly, I, I put together these homework packages and, you know, I had a small class, maybe a dozen students. Um, and of course, a dozen students on a dozen different levels. And I put together differentiated homework for them. You know, so there was some math, some phonics work, some writing activities, and each child had a different package. Um, now, Japan is a homogenous society. And, you know, it, it, it's a society traditionally where people like to kind of be the same. You know, there's, there's a saying in Japanese, the nail that stands up gets hammered down. So um, it is, you know, uh, I, I think we find that in Asia, you know, a, a fair amount with the kind of, it's homogenous. Um, so what happened was me giving out this homework package, been taking a lot of time to make it differentiated, thinking this is, you know, what I should do as a teacher. Um, it blew up on my face and it, it became a huge problem. And what happened essentially was all of those parents were very close to each other outside of, outside of the school context. So they were friends and they would eat together and have parties together and barbecues together. And I, I basically, I, I, it sounds like what happened is that they all got together and they, they pulled out those homework packages and they all compared them. 
And they wondered, why, why does my child have something different than this child and this child? And um, a few of the children whose, whose children, you know, were kind of struggling with English, um, their, their packages fit their needs. And, you know, the work that I gave them was quite a bit different than some of the children who had been studying longer. Um, so what ended up happening was a group of very irate parents showed up at the school after the winter holiday and they demanded to meet the principal and the owner of the school. And they wanted, you know, they wanted to know what's going on here. Um, there was a lot of yelling and screaming in Japanese. And at that point, my (laughs) Japanese wasn't very good, but you know, sometimes you can really, you can, even if you don't understand the language, you can figure out what's going on. You got the message. Yeah. Yeah. When people are are yelling and yelling and screaming and pointing at you, (laughs) um, um, and, and then, so basically what happened is that they blamed me saying that the reason why the children were on different levels, was because it was my fault. Mm. I wasn't a good teacher. I mean, now, of course, you're an educator, and we, we know that when we walk into a classroom every day, we have children that are in so many different places for so many different reasons. Of course. Um, but um, these parents weren't seeing that. And, um, you know, we, we, the administration, we had a big meeting. They tried to explain what differentiated homework was, and this is something that's not typically given in a Japanese public system. So these parents never would have experienced differentiated work. Everyone gets the same. Um, and you know, there's a lot of sink or swim when it comes to surviving in, in, in the local school system. Right. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, we had a big meeting, lots of screaming, lots of yelling. Luckily the owner and the principal completely had my back. They were 120% supportive of me. Um, and they, they ended up like there was a principal and the owner were yelling at the parents, the parents were yelling. And I think it ended up, you know, it's a private school. So it, it basically came down to the owner of the school saying, well, if you don't like it, there's a lot of other schools around, find a new one. Wow. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, so I stayed there until the end of the school year. And I basically, you know, my reputation at that school had been damaged because of this group of parents who said I was an air quotes, bad teacher. You know, how dare I give a differentiated homework? <laughs> um, um, but um, yeah, so I ended up being transferred to another, another campus. Uh, the school had a few campuses. And the next school year was wonderful. It was lovely. Um, and then what happened after that was I think the school learned a lot from, from that incident too. And what the school started doing is at the beginning of each school year, they would basically have workshops for all the parents. They were kind of like a mandatory workshop. And they would talk to them about what is differentiated homework or what is differentiated learning? What does it look like in a classroom? Why are not all children on the same level? Um, and, you know, what, 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 what do teachers do to address that? And the fact that it's impossible to have all children in the same place, you know? Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it, the next year was a lot better. I'll say that. But that, that was a rough year. I mean, no joke. There was a lot of, like, when that was happening, a lot of sleepless nights for me. Um, and, and, you know, I, I seriously was going to leave teaching. Wow. I, I, I had it. I couldn't do it anymore. That was it. I mean, I, I wanted to be a teacher to help children. But, um, yeah, so my, my wife was Japanese. I, I, I talked to her a lot very seriously. And I, I you know, I, I said, what, what could I do? What do I want to do? And I, I decided that I was going to become a police officer. Um, because I wanted to be in a career where I could help other people. So yeah, I went to the process of, I started applying, um, you know, my family lives in Ontario. So I applied to the Peel regional police, the Durham police force, those ones kind of seemed to reach out to me and, and yeah, it was really happening. And, uh, my principal, actually, we had a couple of heart to hearts and she sat down and basically talked me into staying in this career. So, uh, that was gosh, maybe seven or eight years ago. Yeah. And I'm I'm still a teacher and loving it. You know, this story makes me think of uh, another new podcast put out by Jeffrey Frieden, if if I have the right one in mind, called Don't Give Up, Teacher. And, uh, you know, he's he's all about those teachers that really got to the brink or, or seriously considered leaving the profession, and that really fits your story. One thing that I take away from it is just the importance of, you know, the, the school communicating with the parent community, what they're all about and doing a little bit of educating parents in that process. And, you know, I think about my school has, has recently moved to a gradeless assessment system, which for a lot of parents is a bit of a shock, right? It's, it's a bit of a learning curve. Yeah. And with, with these big systemic foundational changes, I think schools have to keep in mind the parents and, and I'm so glad to hear that this administrator had your back and completely went to bat for you. And that doesn't always happen, but so glad you stayed in the profession, Kevin, and, and you've, you've learned from that experience. That's, that sounds pretty tough. 
Yeah, it was it was definitely tough. And <clears throat> again, I, I'm thankful that my administration believed in me. Um, yeah. The owner of the school believed in me. She saw what I could do. I'd, I'd only been teaching there for it was my third year teaching in Japan, my third year with that company. So I mean, I didn't have a very long relationship, but I think I'd worked really hard and proved myself to admin up to that point and showed that I had a passion and that I cared. But um, yeah, that moment really that that moment that stretched over several weeks um, really took the wind out of my sails, I suppose. Thanks so much for sharing that, Kev. I really appreciate that. So let's move on to talk about the Making Better Teachers podcast. That is super exciting. And I love sort of finding or discovering new education podcasts on Twitter. I'm a bit of a a podcast addict. So tell us about the Making Better Teachers podcast. Talk to us about your mission and your vision. Why did you start it? And how do you hope to serve educators? Um, yeah, well, well, I mean, I'm I'm really happy that you you came across the Making Better Teachers podcast. Um, we've got at this point 18 episodes out. It's I don't know. I guess I've been a podcaster for a long time. I've been a podcast uh, fan um, devotee since <laughs> I think uh, 2008. I think I really got into podcasts, and that's when I I'd first moved to Japan, and okay. was, uh, you know, and I had to commute to work. I had to ride the train every day. Right. And, um, you know, when I came across, I believe the first one I ever subscribed to was the Stuff You Should Know podcast. And, right, I remember um, that one, yeah. You know, yeah, it was a really big one. Every every week, a different, no, twice a week, different topics about science and history and stuff. Um, and then I, I just, I caught the bug and I, I, I made a short-lived Canadian history podcast in 2009. Um, and then I was in Japan, so I, I, I then decided to, to create a, a Japan-based um, podcast, which has continued for years and that's always been a lot of fun. Um, so, you know, I, I thought to myself, Hey, I want to make a podcast that I want to listen to. Um, every day teaching in like this international context, I'm meeting really fascinating educators. I work with like they're down the hall, um, from around the world and they have so many different backgrounds and so many different interests and skill sets that I thought, wow, I would love to showcase some of my colleagues. And then, you know, kind of reach out to the world and, and find really interesting educators and have them share their story with other teachers out there. Um, because I know I've been inspired by, over the years, people I've interviewed on my Japan podcast called the Just Japan podcast. Um, so I guess I kind of want to share that inspiration with, with other people. Um, and I'm going to be honest, I also want to build my own profile. You know, I'm a podcast host and, um, you know, it's... Uh, it's, it's, it's good to get your name out there professionally, especially if you're in an international setting. Um, you know, I don't work for a school board or school district. I know every, every few years you're up for a new contract. Um, so you want people to know who you are. It's going to be helpful. Yeah, and that leads right into my next question. I do want to say, though, first that in, in all your years of podcasting, I would imagine the process began a lot more complicated than it is today. And I say that because, you know, I record or or I should say I, I produce and publish this show all through an app called Anchor, which people can do, frankly, from their own phone today, and it's completely free. But but when you started, I would imagine the process was a lot more difficult. How did you figure out how to launch and publish back in 2008, 2009? Um, I guess I've always liked problem solving. Yeah. Uh, before I, I mean, I didn't become a teacher until I was um, in my, tw- my late 20s. Okay. Uh, before that, I was a software developer. Um, so I worked... Uh, I worked at a game development company in, in New Brunswick, Canada. So, you know, and I've always been into blogging. I, I, was, I was writing blogs in the 90s. Uh, you know, the good old days when you'd have to write everything in HTML and Notepad <laughs> yeah. and use an FTP yeah. program to upload it all. And um, so I, I remember I had to, I couldn't, I remember my first podcast was really difficult to find out how to launch it. And I ended up, um, WordPress had a plugin that would allow you to upload mp3 files okay and i basically would would record it edit it all in garage band no not even that it was before i had a mac um I, I don't even know what i was using maybe audacity and then i would upload it to wordpress and it was hosted on wordpress and then i would then have to just try to share that link on facebook or um i had a youtube channel so i'd be like hey everyone i've got a podcast go look at it please <laughs> and go listen um yeah. so it was not easy it was definitely not easy now i'm using uh, libsyn as a as a hosting service and um even in the years I've been using Libsyn, it just every year it gets easier. 
Awesome. Well, you mentioned uh, you know international teaching and the importance of, of building your profile in the sense of you know people have to know what you what you're all about, who you are, your experience, your philosophy of education, all those all those good things. So, talk to us about that. When I look at my PLN, there seems to be great relationships between English speaking educators across Eastern Asia. So, tell us about the experience of teaching in a foreign country and. And talk about the importance of developing relationships with other educators in Asia and across the world. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I think there's a fantastic uh, PLN here in Eastern Asia, and, and mine's constantly growing. Um, I think that you know now I've I've got family who teach in Canada, and you know I've got a brother who teaches in Ontario, and um, you know he's involved in the union and all these kind of things, and you know there's there's. I, I suppose, I, I mean, I'm not sure how much community there is, so to speak, but, you know, you, you get a city, you get a board, there's a lot of teachers working there. Um, I know there's like, you know, board PD and different things. Um, when, you're, when you're an international teacher, if you're in a big city like Beijing, like I am, for example, there are a lot of big international schools. So there's actually quite a pool of international teachers, say, in the city. But if you're living in a smaller city in Japan or Korea, your international school might be the only game in town. And it can feel a bit isolating at times because the only other teachers, you know, English speaking professional teachers around might be the people in your building and that's it. Uh, so I think, you know, creating a PLN online using Twitter and stuff is a great way to, to network, to get out there and, and meet new teachers to get great ideas and to build relationships. Um, and I mean, I had a guest who was on the podcast, uh, I don't know, a, a couple of months ago. And one thing she mentioned is that you know, she was saying that she really thinks international teachers have to really always up their game more than maybe teachers in Canada or America might have to do because there might be a certain level of comfort if you are working long term in a Canadian school board because you you may have security. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're going to retire doing this. But if you're an international educator, every few years you have to renew your contract. Right. Um, and, you know, there's always a chance that maybe that's not going to happen. Or if it's time to move on, maybe you want to move, you know, level up your career, you want to move on to a new school. It's really competitive, really hyper competitive uh, to get a job at a big international school in Asia. And there's a lot of incredibly qualified people you're up against when it's job hunting season. So you really want to make yourself stand out. And, you know, on Twitter, showing what you do in your classroom, by creating content, by being a blogger, you know, working towards becoming a presenter at conferences. Those are things that a lot of people I know in my PLN work towards to, I suppose, get noticed. Um, and when, when you have that PLN too, um, I think when it comes time for looking for work, when you have connections, say you, you know so-and-so who works at this school in Hong Kong, and you know these people who work at a school in Singapore, you kind of have an in there, right? you know? Um, and, you know, when you say, like, I'm going to apply to your school, could you maybe talk to your uh, vice principal or principal and mention me? Um, you know, those things can sometimes, you know, become a reality. Yeah. Yeah. Kevin, you've got a well-established YouTube channel. You've got a whole ton of subscribers over there. You're posting video content regularly on Twitter, which I love, by the way. I love the, I love the walk-arounds that you do. You're a photographer and a designer. So you mentioned content creation, talked a lot about it. Why do you think it's important for educators to get in on that and share their voice and, and maybe speak to that process of self-reflection? How do those two things connect? Well, okay. Um, I, I started YouTube, being a YouTube content creator very early on, back in 2006, actually. The platform was pretty new. Um, I think the first year of the platform. Uh, and, you know, I, I had moved to Japan. And to be honest, there's a lot of people who are really interested in Japan, traveling there, life there, the food. And there were very few people making content at the time. Um, so because I was one of the few, I kind of very quickly grew an audience. And, you know, I think, you know, the, the, the whole idea of content creation is, I mean, I'm someone who's always seeking information. You know, I'm a consumer. You know, I, if I, you know, I want to better my teaching. So I'm out there looking for podcasts. You know, I came across your podcast that way and subscribe because I'm always, uh, you know, I'm, I'm interested in entomology. I love bugs. I'm subscribed to about a half dozen insect <laughs> podcasts. Like they're out there. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> and so, I mean, you know, I, I'm someone who's always consuming and I've got very kind of specific things I'm interested in. So I basically want to, I don't know, 
what comes around goes around, I suppose. I want to also create content for those out there who are looking for certain things. Um, so, I mean, I really feel that like teachers out there, there's, you know, I work with a lot of fantastic educators who do wonderful things. And I wish they, I, I'm trying to encourage them to share more because I don't want to say it's, it's, it's a waste if no one sees it, um, what they're doing, because their kids are obviously, the kiddos in their classroom are benefiting every day. Um, but they would be so, it would be such a help to new teachers out there or veteran teachers who are looking for new ideas. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I don't live in Japan anymore. Um, so obviously my, my YouTube channel isn't about Japan. But I, I think in the future, I would like to kind of get more into teaching vlogs. Because um, I think that's, again, that's, this is another, that's another great medium for, for helping teachers, kind of showing things that I'm doing in class or ideas that I have or different, I don't know, projects I want to begin. And it makes, um, it makes you think about your own practice, right? A little more deeply. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think that's one of the things that people like on the PL, like in my PLN, um, are often asking, they're asking deep questions. And I think of some of the guests who've been on my show, like Tanya Gilchrist or Adam Hill. Um, these are people who are, they're writing, they're writing very thoughtful blogs and they're posting those on their Twitter. And then they're asking questions and they're asking people in their PLN, they're asking us to reflect. And I, I think to be honest, if I wasn't on Twitter and following so many great teachers, I probably wouldn't be as reflective as I yeah. am. Yeah. Well, there you go. Content creation. We've got the, you know, building your message and your profile, sharing the wealth of ideas from your own practice and just that process of self-reflection, I think are great reasons to get out there and create your own content, not just be a consumer. I think consuming is really important, but also creating. It's kind of that inhale, exhale process that we should all be a part of. So. As you look across your PLN and your own practice, Kevin, what is it that excites you about education today? This could be a big picture kind of idea or something on the micro level happening right there in your classroom. Uh, well, so many things excite me, um, but I got to admit that like, my, my big passion is all about outdoor learning, um, out, getting kids outside. Um, that's, that's the goal for me. So things like um, Outdoor Classroom Day, which is big on Twitter and getting bigger each year. Um, there's something out of the UK called the Dirty Hands Movement. Uh, th those really excite me. And those are all about getting kids outdoors. And as strange as it may say that I'm saying that, I think when we, you know, when I reflect, uh, I'm, I'm in my early 40s. And when I look back at my childhood, the childhood that I had growing up in Eastern Canada is very different than the childhood that a lot of children in Canada have today. Um, and children most certainly in, in these international settings have. Um, you know, I, a lot of the kids I teach simply don't get to play outside. Uh, you know, on the weekends, they, they live in the middle of a big city. They live in big apartment buildings that may not have playgrounds downstairs. You know, they, they have, they just don't have access to a lot of things. So I think I'm, I'm, I get really excited following teachers who are doing awesome stuff outdoors. And there's a lot of teachers in Canada who are doing really cool things too. Um, you know, I, I just, yeah, the idea of taking, taking the classroom outside. Um, and I, you know, of course the, the whole idea of, of, of play is, is big, but again, just like taking your math lessons outdoors, taking your literacy outside, um, giving the children a chance to get their hands dirty. Um, yeah. you know, again, a lot of the kids don't have the opportunities that I had and the freedom to just kind of run around and explore the natural world. So, um, that's, that's what I'm all about. Very cool. You know, I saw a friend, I have a classmate in my master's program teaching in Finland, and she was posting this week about outdoor day. And I didn't know what that was all about. And now I know. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, yes, I love the sound of that too. I, I can't, I can't say enough about getting our video gamers outside, I think is really, really important. I was going to say that shot, like I teach grade one, right? So I'm teaching the little one. And by the way, outdoor classroom day is May 23rd. So I, 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 I'm a big advocate. So, so go check that out, guys. Outdoorclassroomday.com. Sign your classes up. Um, <laughs> my school, it was beautiful last year. Myself and we have a, another teacher at our school who really got inspired with it. And we were able to get, at one point, we had something like 700 kids playing outside at the same time. It was brilliant. Kevin, how are you looking to grow professionally and improve your practice this year? Can you share with us about a specific professional goal or maybe a project that you're currently working on? Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it completely ties in with what I was talking about just, just a few moments ago. Um, I'm, I'm changing schools, so I'm, I am going to be leaving Beijing. Um, I've had a great couple of years working at the place I work now, um, but we're, we're moving south to, the, to uh, close to Hong Kong, 
And one of my goals is to basically become more experienced with, with being outdoors and teaching effectively outdoors. So um, one, one thing I would like to do, I'm hoping within the next year or so, I can get some, some training into becoming a forest kindergarten practitioner. So um, that's a pretty cool thing that's very popular across Europe. And I, I think they're starting to pop up in Canada too now. But um, basically taking that learning outside all the time. Wow. So uh, Phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, I, I always say to people, I would be perfectly happy if I never had to be in a building again <laughs> when I'm working. That's remarkable. I'm trying to imagine kindergarten in the woods every day or in the park or whatever that looks like, but that is awesome. Kevin, outside of education, what is another area of learning for you? I think this is so important for educators. So I want to hear about something that ignites your passions outside of the classroom and really brings you alive as a human being. Okay. Um, you know, we all have our geek flags to fly. Um, sure. I, I'm, a, I'm a bug and bird geek. So I, I actually, I love insects. So um, ornithology and entomology. So, and I also love nature photography. And I, I think you know, for, for, for a period of time when I was living in Japan, I was actually very seriously contemplating becoming a professional nature for wildlife photographer. I would spend every moment I had on a weekend or on my way to school. I used to have a cycle commute to school. Um, you know, I would, I would leave the house early and stop by ponds and lakes and just take photos of birds and insects and then learn about them and learn about, you know, what they were, why they were there, about their place in the, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the habitat, the bigger picture things. Um, and I, I think that's, that, that makes me happy. But I also have always been able to bring that joy into my classroom. Because I teach little kids. And um, like I was saying to you pre-interview, you want to be a rock star in an elementary school, be the bug guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I mean, like, I, and I love catching stuff and bringing it in. I'm always bringing in, like, you know, like geckos and lizards I find, and mantises and grasshoppers, and showing them to the kids, and we all go and release them. And I mean, it's gotten to the point now where I even get like, you know, the, the high school science teachers are sending high school kids to my classroom to ask me questions. You know, I'll be I'll be in the middle of teaching a class, and some some boy will show up who's about a foot and a half taller than me. Who be like, are you Mr. O'Shea? I'm like, that's right. And he's like, uh, what's this? And showing me a picture on his phone of a bug. I'm like, ah, well, let me tell you. Um, so it, it, it's it's been it's been cool because again, I can I can often connect it with different units we're learning in class, um, and it's just it, it's another great way to connect the kiddos I teach with that natural world. It kind of makes you think of a scene from Master and Commander, a Russell Crowe movie, where where some of the crew are, are they visit the Galapagos and they, they start drawing every insect they find. It's, it's kind of cool. neat, but I guess you'd have to see the movie. <laughs> share about, <laughs> share about a personal habit or productivity hack, Kevin, that contributes to your success. We know you keep busy in the classroom. You've got all these other passions and interests. You're putting out two podcasts. So how do you make it all happen? Okay, coffee is an important part of what yes. makes, makes things happen. Um, and it, it's really funny. I thought of this, and it seems like such a small thing, but it's the first thing that popped into my mind. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sluggish when I first wake up in the morning. And, and simple tasks are, are pretty challenging to accomplish, like things like putting on socks, um, you know, <laughs> um, shaving. Like, I don't know why, but like in the morning, it seems to take me five times longer than if I did it the evening before. Um, so to be honest, like I've got a big old fashioned coffee maker, like a 12 cup coffee maker and literally, um, you know, the, the water here in Beijing isn't recommended to drink the tap okay. water. Okay. It's not really, we call it potable. So I've got like, you know, my big 18 liter blue jugs of water and it takes time to fill up my coffee maker with that. Um, so, uh, if, if for some reason I decide I'm going to make my coffee in the morning and set it all up, it just seems to take the whole morning. <laughs> But if I do it the night before, I can I can do it in five minutes, and so I, you know my alarm goes off and at like five forty, and I wake up and I just push the button, and ten minutes later I've got coffee. Um, it just I don't know, it, it's a simple thing, but it makes my mornings a lot easier. And then of course, when you're a teacher, if your morning starts off right, the day should be okay. I love that, and uh, I'm like you, I'm a big coffee guy. I kind of go throughout the day with coffee, so that makes a lot of sense. Kevin, in a moment, I'm going to ask you for your quick picks. But first of all, I'm, I want to share a really important message to educators in our audience. 
Are you looking to reach more students, innovate your instruction, and teach better? Then you need to join the Teach Better team on November 8th and 9th in Northeast Ohio for the first ever Teach Better conference. Join dynamic educators such as Dave Burgess, Tall Tal Thompson, Adam Welcome, and many more. Register now at teachbetterconference.com. And when you do, be sure to use discount code FIRE50. That's FIRE50 to save $50 on either of the two-day registration options. Are you ready to be better? So, Kevin, I'd like to get a sense of the education voices and resources that are shaping your practice and inspiring your thinking today. So starting at Twitter, tell us about someone we should follow there and share why they've been inspiring you lately. Okay, the first person I thought of is because I love his Twitter feed would be Mike Bycraft. And Mike Bycraft is a, um, he's a teacher, a uh, technology teacher based uh, in Korea. He works at Korea International School. So his Twitter is at M-A-B-Y craft, um, M-A-B-Y craft. And, and he just, you know, you mentioned that you, you like those videos that I put up. He puts up just fantastic videos of robots that the kids have made, of robot battles, of just really wild things that are happening in his very um, cool maker space. So Mike Bycraft. Okay, awesome. Point us to an ed tech tool that you currently love using in your classroom or professional practice. Um, I, it's, it's mentioned a lot, I'm sure, but I teach grade one Seesaw. Seesaw is an amazing tool. Use it daily. Great way to show the, the, the parents and the family members what, what the kids are learning each and every day in, in, in class. So good. I have to second that as well. Recommend a book, one that you've been reading lately or one of your all-time faves and tell us why you recommend it. Well, an all-time fave, I've read it a few times, I'm probably going to read it again soon, would be Last Child in the Woods by Richard Louvre. And it's all about um, how, uh, you know, current generations of children are becoming more and more disconnected from nature and the natural world. Mm. So uh, obviously in a time of, of climate change and, and us as, as, a, as adults having to do something about it, um, I think one of the most effective ways is for us to reconnect ourselves and the children we teach with nature. Hmm. I have not heard of that title, but sounds intriguing. Kevin, you're a podcaster, so I look forward to this answer. Tell us about a podcast in your deck and maybe one that we need to add to ours. Okay. So a non-teaching podcast that I love, I listen to every day. It's like a daily, it's a daily geek show. It's called The Morning Stream. So The Morning Stream is just a fantastic show where it's covering funny news, geek culture, comics, all that stuff. I like that. And um, I thought of, as far as education goes, of course, the, uh, the Teachers on Fire podcast. Of course, yeah. <laughs> and um, I, I'm a big fan of the, the Cult of Pedagogy uh, with Jennifer mm. Gonzalez. That's a, that's a brilliant podcast. Yeah, she is awesome. Amazing, amazing leader. Tell us about a YouTube channel that you enjoy and explain why. First thing that pops in my mind is Brave Wilderness. Uh, there's a guy named Coyote Peterson. He's from the States. He's kind of like a uh, crocodile hunter kind of guy. And uh, his cha his channel is incredible. He just actually got a he was he was a YouTuber who just got a, a TV show on Animal Planet. But um, his channel is so kid friendly. Teaches them all about amazing animals and why they should be getting out there and learning more about nature. And and I love it too. I mean, I want to be this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and then and, you know, I have to ask you on that. So YouTube, like my my kids after they've or sorry, my students after they've gone over and spent time in China and come back. Um, they'll they'll tell me things like Facebook is not accessible. So it, YouTube and Google the, these platforms you can access them no problem. And, and and for that matter, iTunes as well. You're gonna need to run something called a VPN. So you're gonna you're yeah. gonna you're gonna yeah. need okay. software a, a virtual private network. Um, uh, what happens is a lot of companies and educational private education institutions may have something called a blanket VPN. So the entire building is under a VPN. Um, and if if you're ever gonna move to China. I recommend, you know, um, definitely spend a bit of money, get yourself a good VPN on all your devices and stuff. Once you have that, yes, you can access YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, without it, though, I think it's um, the vast majority of it is blocked. Okay. Yeah. Ah, so that's how you uh, that's how you can remain as connected as you are and and publish all of your great stuff. Yeah. So the last question relates to that as well. But I love to hear from educators just for fun. What are you watching on Netflix right now? All right, I, I like zombies and scary stuff. Um, I'm the only, I'm the only one in my family, so I often have to watch this alone, at, at, like in my bedroom. But I just finished <laughs> watching the new Netflix series, uh, Black Summer. Um, so that that was like nine short episodes. So that was a lot of fun for me. And I'm also really with my family. I'm really enjoying the new uh, Our Planet 
um, series that was out the old uh, Attenborough series. Yes, yes, those are both coming up in my in my feed, and and uh, so I like that Black Summer review. Thank you for that, Kevin. What are the best ways for the listeners to follow you and get connected with what you are putting out there? Well, um, you can always find me on Twitter at Mad for Maple. That's uh, you know because we all love our maple syrup. Sure. So Mad for Maple. Um, you know, I've got I've got two websites for my my two different podcasts for the Making Better Teachers podcast. You just simply go to makingbetterteachers.com. Um, all the options are there, how to find the podcast. Um, if you're, for whatever reason, interested in Japan things, my weekly show about Japan, I interview different, like, eclectic people who, who live there. Um, that's called, uh, you go to justjapanstuff.com. On Instagram, I'm at jlandkev. That was for, like, Japan land Kev. Jland Kev. Um, yeah, and I've got Facebook pages for both websites. So Facebook, making just search for Making Better Teachers or Just Japan Stuff. And um, last but not least, my, my YouTube uh, so when I first created my YouTube channel, I was living in the city of Busan, Korea. So um, not the most creative name, but it's uh, Busan Kevin. Can't can't change that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard to uh, hard to start all over. So Busan Kevin is is definitely worth a visit as well. And I think you're you're actually posting your podcast there as well. Is that right? Not as regular as I should. I know I should do it more, but I am I am posting episodes there of both my podcasts. I mean, that's over the years. There was a lot of people who were my part of my like kind of devo- devoted YouTube audience who were just like, man, like we don't like we want to hear your content, but we just we do everything on YouTube. Yeah. So they, they, uh. some, yeah, yeah. So I've had people just like we don't want to bother like downloading podcasts. So we're just like if it is if it's not on YouTube, we're not going to consume it. So then I, I would I would put the audio up of some of my podcasts, which is like a static screen, and um, yeah, you know, fair number of people would listen to it. Well, I, I'm doing the same thing, Kevin, with this podcast, and I've got about 27,000 fewer subscribers than you do, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I think it's a good idea. I think you're right. A lot of people uh, just go to YouTube for everything, so why not? Hey, Kevin, uh, this was so much fun. I'll make sure to get all of those links and contact information up at teachersonfire.net, and again, thank you so much for sharing your time with the podcast today. I know you've got uh, a big family day there happening in Beijing today. So uh, I really appreciate you sharing a little bit of your morning with me. Take care and can't wait to connect with you and talk again soon on Twitter. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for joining me today here on the Teachers on Fire podcast. For show notes and links from this episode, visit teachersonfire.net. You can also follow the show at Teachers on Fire on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Medium. And again, please do subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. This week on the Teachers on Fire magazine on Medium, check out a story called F is for Frankenstein, Focus and Future Ready by Lynn Thomas. You can follow Lynn on Twitter at TomLynn101. In this piece, Lynn writes about how just as the advent of the typewriter didn't make writing any better, so the advent of new technology doesn't automatically create better learning. If you're new to Medium, let me just tell you that the Teachers on Fire magazine is called a Medium publication. Find us on Medium.com or on the Medium app. If you're already an education blogger, great. Consider joining our growing writing team. You can continue to publish content on your own blog, just as you always have, and then cross-post your content over on the Teachers on Fire magazine. You get to keep full credit and ownership of your content, and best of all, you can even earn compensation for the engagement that your pieces earn. Message Teachers on Fire on any social media platform for more details. I also want to continue to thank all those who encourage and support the podcast on Twitter. At Mrs. Jankford tweeted, Loving the Teachers on Fire podcast. Listen to guest Mr. Adam Welcome while on my 10-mile run this morning. Talk about motivation. Coincidental empowerment. Hashtag teachers who run. Hashtag run like a pirate. Keep up the running, Ariel. Your encouragement keeps me going here. Again, I'm your host, Tim Cavey, thanking you for listening and saying goodbye for now. I'll hope to catch you next week right here on the Teachers on Fire podcast.